Thanks, John, for joining us tonight um, to give us a bit of an update on implemented portfolios, our esteemed partners in investment management um, with our, a lot of our clients. Um, so John's going to run through tonight a few, few updates around um, you know, the economy, the financial markets and the like, some thoughts around um, budget nights, um, around uh, how we see the Russian you know, matter on, you know, circumstance unfold and the like. So um, I guess without further ado, I'll, I'll pass on to you, John, to, to take us through your content tonight and, and appreciate your time. Pleasure. Thanks, Sebastian, and, and welcome, guys. Um, yeah, we've got, I'm going to try and speak for about half an hour, uh, but there's quite a lot to get through. But um, that said, also, if you do have any questions on the way through, um, I'm more than happy to take them on the, right, on the way through rather than saving them till the end as well. So I wanted to start by just sort of looking at the big picture environment. It's been a fascinating world in which, uh, well, in which to be a human as well as to in which to be an investor. Obviously a lot going on and, and certainly plenty of things that we can't predict, um, you know, with, with, with any certainty. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Really, I want to I want to just remind you of probably something that's maybe familiar, which is just the elements of our long term forecast, and that drives our decision making. Um, and you know, as much as we've just spoken about the things that we can't predict, as an investment committee, you know, my colleagues we've got well in excess of a hundred years experience, and we've remarked often that it's you know it's remarkable that you know how how often our forecasting process gets you leaning in the right direction. Uh, which is sort of out of the way of the things that are expensive and, and uh, more susceptible to damage when we do see some volatility uh, like we've seen in recent, recent times. The inflation environment is the number one story um, in economics, in markets, uh, how central banks are responding to rising inflation and trying to normalise their monetary policy away from emergency era settings is really central to everything in portfolio management. So spend quite a bit of time going through that with you. Um, how that's affecting some of the defensive assets in the portfolio. Uh, again, really remarkable uh, developments in things like government bond yields and, and how traditional defensive assets have been behaving of late. Um, I'll step you through the tables which go on the back of the commentary. Uh, we find sort of going through those, um, you know, a couple of times, even though they might be somewhat familiar, you can often pick up some insights there. And again, we've had some, some reasonable changes around what's been happening around risk-free rates. Um, and, and some, to be honest, and pleasingly, some, some pretty good resilience in terms of the riskier asset classes like equities. And then just a couple of quick comments to finish um, around international and Australian equities there. So uh, the Ukraine obviously is, is one of those things which, you know, no one thought was going to be an issue at the start of the year. Um, how it plays out really probably still resides in the mind of one man, um, and no one really knows what that looks like. Um, really pleased to see some encouraging signs overnight in terms of developments of the peace talks um, held in Turkey. Uh, and it does, does start to think, uh, you know, you can see the outlines of how uh, Vladimir Putin can dress up an outcome where he perhaps retains a little bit more influence in the east of the country um, and sort of, you know, markets that to his home audience as a victory of sorts. Uh, also very conscious here that, you know, there's a long history of geopolitical events and, and investment managers, to, you know, uh, I want to try and um, uh, attain expertise in areas beyond, um, you know, their, their training and their experience. It's only in the last year or two that, you know, a lot of time spent becoming amateur epidemiologists as we tried to grapple with the impacts of the virus and the global pandemic. Um, geopolitics is obviously an on, on, ongoing issue and how it can impact financial markets. But I guess more pertinently, I wrote a commentary a few months ago now where I said most of these things come and go without requiring a direct response in terms of how we're managing and how we're positioning your client portfolio. And certainly for now, and touch wood that remains the case, you know, the right thing to do in the portfolios in response to what's happening in the Ukraine has been not much at all pay very, very close attention, and, and I can promise you we do that, um, but really not to re overreact to the short term. And, you know, a useful way of thinking about it is not just trying to predict outcomes, but then also trying to predict what the market reaction to those potential outcomes is going to be. Um, and if we're honest with ourselves, then you've got a pretty low probability of those sorts of events and trying to pre-position a portfolio for a particular outcome is fraught with danger and not something we try to do on an ongoing basis. So. 
Uh, we've got some significant exposures in the portfolio to Europe and, and, and also to the UK, and they've come under pressure. But uh, we'll talk about that in, in, in the context of sort of the elements of our forecast and how some of those are related to fundamental inputs and some of those are related to more short term sentiment impacts. But for now, we're watching closely. We're hopeful, obviously, is from a humanitarian point of view, first and foremost, that we do see a quick resolution and a cessation to the hostilities in Ukraine. What does it look like in terms of market reaction? So this is the world index. This is just you know a line that captures all of the major share markets around the world. Um, and in the top right hand corner, you, you can see at the start of the year there was quite a decent sell off, um, but we've also seen a, you know a, a relatively quick recovery there as well. Uh, more pertinently, if we go back, and this is a three year chart, a really sharp sell off, obviously COVID induced global pandemic and global recession, but it was all over within a month. Um, and so what we find is this saying, which I've, I've been writing about in one of the commentaries, which you'll get hopefully tomorrow, you know, the, a, a saying in markets that uh, we tend to climb a wall of worry. And certainly there's been some high profile fund managers that, uh, you know, have been under invested through this rally over the last year or so. Um, and their performance is starting to show that. Uh, so again, you know, focusing on, on a long term approach and the elements of our forecasting, which I'll step you through in just a sec, has been a really useful, um, you know, parameters and, and, and process and guidelines to, um, you know, stay the course uh, to continue to um, climb that wall of worry, as I mentioned, and, and ultimately to deliver some pretty handy portfolio returns um, over that last sort of 12, 18 months as we've been relatively fully invested through that recovery phase. There's an analogy that's been sort of kicking around in my head since this, you know, that COVID induced panic. And I've sort of been contrasting lightning strikes and, and comparing what we saw in markets to a lightning strike. And it's not that they can't be you know, predicted entirely. Uh, there are certainly some science around that. But lightning strikes like a COVID induced pandemic or indeed a war in Ukraine is not something that's, that fits into our forecast models and that we try and predict and again pre-position portfolios for what we think is the outcome. Um, so it's something again that we need to be aware of. But more the, the sort of other side of this analogy, which I've um, again been sort of working on for some time here is, is more the avalanche. And there's some fascinating studies and reading around avalanche management and safety and, and really some quite fascinating overlays with risk management behavior between alpine skiers and investors, um, you know, that we, we tend to sort of go past the side of a mountain and it doesn't fall on top of us for time after time after time until it does. And so really the avalanche risk within markets is that accumulation of high valuations. Uh, and it's probably the number one thing that we're trying to do in terms of protecting your investment portfolio is getting you out of the way of the risks that we think we can identify ahead of time. Um, there's, there's a quote here, which is from some of the reading I've done around, around avalanches and, and also lightning strikes there as well. But, you know, there's, there's very intelligent people, there's experienced investors, alpine rescue teams who see these risks full on understand them for what they are, but put themselves in positions where they can be harmed, either in terms of a, a really long and damaging portfolio outcome or pay the ultimate price if it's, if it's out on the side of a mountain. So at the risk of torturing the analogy a little bit, one of the, one of the interesting aspects I've, I've read about more recently is how they try and manage risks ahead of time. And it occurred to me that there's, uh, there's an, an analogy here with what central banks are trying to do so I'm not a skier, maybe some of you on the line are and, and we're aware of this, but they send out teams before they let skiers out into these tourist resorts when they know there's a buildup of snow on the mountain, they drop bombs, you know, they fire grenades. Um, you can see them making bombs here as well and then firing cannons into the side of the mountain to try and release some of that snowpack so it doesn't fall on, on skiers when they get out there. What we're seeing here is, is what central banks are trying to do at the moment and gradually sort of slowly starting to try and raise interest rates and normalize monetary policy away from these emergency eras, uh, emergency era settings where not just did we get interest rates down to zero, um, but they obviously went beyond zero in, in, in a meaningful sense in terms of some of the extraordinary policy there as well. So. Hopefully that resonates a little bit and I'm not going on a wild tangent, but um, it's a useful analogy in the way we think about things in terms of managing risk um, in, in the real world for us in terms of uh, markets and investment portfolios as well. 
So just very quickly, when we sit around the table as an investment committee, uh, we're really just trying to answer three questions. And you know, if we can answer these three questions, which are how much income is this investment going to pay you? How quickly is that rate of income going to grow? And what will someone pay for your asset in the future? If we can get a good sense on those three questions, we can develop a reasonable handle on uh, what long-term expected returns are going to be. So in an equity sense, how much are your dividends going to be? Importantly, including franking credits. Um, and notably, I guess, with another federal election coming up that we're not um, not anticipating, or, or certainly the, the opposition's not outlining that they're going to do anything with regard to franking credits. So we can all rest a little bit easier on that one. Um, but how much, yeah, how much are your dividends going to be? How quickly a company is going to grow their earnings, which is where the dividends are obviously paid from. And then where do valuations sit? You know, how much are people going to pay to buy your asset from you in the future? So those first two elements, income and earnings growth, are really what we think of as fundamental aspects of your long-term return. And that they are what dominate your returns over the extended period. No, we're good. We've got some raised hands, Sebastian. Do you want to take questions or? You're on mute. Yeah, I'm just I'm just checking what they are. Just hold on. Okay. Just keep continuing on. I'll come back to you. Uh, and then the last one is valuations. So really, you know, how much are people paying to get into these asset classes? Are they exuberant and are paying very high prices? Um, and therefore that, that has some embedded risks because high prices today generally mean lower future returns. Or perhaps there are even people a bit fearful um, and, and there's some discounts and bargains, but uh, you know people are too scared to buy them. So that's really what we're trying to do. And everything we frame, all these discussions around, whether it's geopolitics or pandemics or interest rates or inflation or valuations and, and those sorts of things is really about trying to answer these questions. And you know the, the relatively sophisticated model that drives our decision-making and ultimately what ends up in your portfolio and in what proportions, but just as equally to what doesn't make it into your portfolio. Just before you move on, yeah. I'll just double check. Um, yeah, one of our guests, Kanyo, uh, did raise his hand. I just wanted to check, Kanyo, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, can you can hear me? Yep, yep. All good. Okay, I sent it through the chat channel, but I'll, I'll say it out loud. Uh, so as uh, interest rates uh, rise, uh, and obviously budget last night said, boy, yeah, 2024, we're going to have a bit of a hike. Is that going to put uh, equity markets a little bit at risk uh, with you know conservative investors trying to take money out of uh, equities and put it back into cash? I the short answer is I think in part yes. Um, it's 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 one element of of what equities are going to do, um, and and I might uh, well. The, the significant change in interest rates and, and in terms of you know risk-free rates and defensive assets um, are normalising away from historically very low levels, um, but probably not all the way back to what we were used to. So, you know, for a long time I've been saying to investors, the days of getting five or six or seven percent out of your term deposits aren't coming back. Uh, but equally, the days of getting nothing out of your defensive assets are gone as well. So this is really central to the debate on, and, and you know, a key a key decision that and, you know, that needs to be made by asset allocators at the moment. It's not just you know that the point you make is a really important one about it's that marginal allocation of the next investment dollar. Um, you know, as an institutional investor or a pension fund manager or something like that. Uh, you know, there's there's been trillions and trillions of dollars invested around the world in government bonds with negative returns. Most of those are actually gone now. Um, and, and in some instances, those investors are compelled to invest in those assets. Otherwise, there's very few reasons to hold something that's going to give you an, a guaranteed negative return. Um, so yeah, with, with government bonds at the moment at about 2.8 uh, versus comfortably under 1% not that long ago, that's going, to, that's going to certainly influence asset allocators' decisions and investors on you know, where they make their investment. There's broader ramifications there as well in terms of valuations. And typically what we've observed historically is that in higher interest rate and higher inflationary environments, valuations do come under pressure. So you start to see it eat away at the expected returns there as well. Now, the, the, the parts of the equity market that are most impacted are areas like the technology sector. So because 
uh, without sort of getting too far into the weeds, because a lot of their profits are well off into the future. And certainly, obviously, in some famous cases, there's companies that don't make anything at the moment, but promise they will do in the future. Because we're discounting those future earnings now at a much higher number, um, their valuations come under pressure. And we've actually seen some, you know, some relatively poor performance out of those former market darlings and the tech leaders, particularly in the US market. Um, so, yeah, look, the short answer to your question is yes, they, they, it is changing the dynamic you know, of, of the investment landscape quite substantially at the moment, for sure. Um, I'll cover a bit more of this sort of stuff in the next couple of points as well. But if there's anything that is, you know, still unclear, then then please just let me know and I'll uh, I'll endeavour to answer that again for you. All right. So the inflationary environment, there's there's been a long-standing phenomena in the investment world where they call it the magazine cover indicator, and it's a contrary indicator. There's a famous uh, famous one back from the 70s. And, the same publication had uh, had a title called The Death of Equities, just as equity markets went on a multi-year rally, substantial rally. Um, so this is often a good contrarian indicator. You'll see here, this one came out in April 2019. Inflation was dead. It wasn't, wasn't something that we ever needed to concern ourselves with again until November of 2021, and it's back. Um, so if we if we follow that sort of contrarian indicator uh, again then perhaps by the time it makes it onto a magazine cover then the worst is behind us and maybe things are improving that's kind of the optimistic interpretation of these contrarian uh, magazine covers but here's really what's been happening underneath and this is the us because they're sort of leading this story at the moment and uh, i will i will come and talk about some australian equivalents in just a second but these are these colored bars are what's contributing to overall price pressures or cpi consumer price index on a year-on-year -year basis um, in in the us so you know starting in the top right hand corner oh, i've chopped that chart off unfortunately i'm sorry that's that's um nearly 7.9 percent is the most recent reading you can see in the table on the top left hand side there um you know nearly eight percent in round numbers us cpi haven't been seen for sort of 40 odd years um but let's look at the colored components here as well so the orange and the green is goods uh, and the green is energy so energy we know what's going on there there's obviously disruptions you can see back in 2020 as the economy the world economy and the american economy indeed as well shut down that you had negative inflationary inputs there from the energy sector because we didn't go anywhere we didn't spend anything you know famously with some some sort of market anomalies very briefly um oil traded at minus 40 dollars a barrel um for a very brief moment back in 2020 and it's now obviously comfortably above a hundred dollars a barrel now the next part is the orange and that's the goods and really what that's talking about is a really significant change in household consumption patterns through that period as well where we couldn't go anywhere we we ordered all our durable goods we upgraded our fridges and tvs and, and spent a lot of money online and had it delivered and that then sort of broke the global supply chain because factories were impacted by workers who had viruses you know things like chips um semiconductor chips for um automobiles most prominently but some, a lot of other sectors as well uh, just before we, we got into the start of this year there were some encouraging signs around those global supply chains and we were starting to see some improvements um you know things like we look at container port uh, container ships sitting off the ports of los angeles and long beach and how, how many um, containers they're processing the reality was they were processing as many as that ever did but demand was huge and demand was hard to keep up with. But now as we sort of go through these stages of the virus where we do reopen a little bit and we start to move our spending patterns away from those durable goods and back into the services sector, and we like going to restaurants and bars and traveling again, it seems reasonable to me that we'll see, you know, the heat come out of both those green and those orange bars, you know, touch wood, we get some resolution out of um, the Ukraine conflict and we see energy prices normalize. We see, you know, some continued improvement in those supply chains that take the pressures out of those durable goods. Um, and we will start to see, you know, inflation normalize. Now, the central banks have got to run this sort of scenario. And then my sense is from an American perspective in particular, there's, there's certainly a lot of market pressure on the, you know, there's, there's a dominant narrative within, within the investment markets at the moment about, 
you know, the Fed's behind the curve. They're not doing enough. Inflation's getting out of control, which I discount. I think that's, I think that's punditry and that's, that's market noise. Um, the Fed's very well aware of what's causing these things. Of course they are. And they're also very well aware that a lot of these are going to correct themselves um, and they're not going to be corrected by raising interest rates and making costs, you know, the cost of money higher. That's not going to enable more containers to be processed through ports or, you know, OPEC countries to, to produce more barrels of oil. So I, my, my sense is, and, and they would never say it this candidly, that they will raise interest rates. Um, you know, Jay Powell's been very clear about that. They're on that path already. I don't think they'll raise them anywhere near as many times as the market currently expects. They will um, primar prim primarily because they, don't, they won't have to. You know, we will start to see these inflation numbers moderate just as a function of the maths at the very least, um, as we see these really high numbers start to come out of it. So, um, you know, again, central to everything that's going on in terms of markets and economics at the moment. And, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to bore you about it in written commentaries for probably many more months to come. But... Um, as always, if there's any questions on any of this stuff, I'd be most happy to take them. There's where the two magazine covers came out, by the way. So again, hopefully the, uh, the, the contrarian indicator works and right about the time that that was published is perhaps about the time that we start to get inflation under control. So here's the Australian view. Um, now, this is there's two measures of inflation in here. The white line is what the RBA actually pays attention to. It's what they call their trimmed mean. It takes some of the more volatile items out of the basket of, of, of prices that they're observing. Clearly now that would be energy and, 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 and um, housing and those sorts of things. So um, that's the number. It's, it's sitting bang on in the middle of the red and the green bars, which is two and 3%. And that's where the, the, the Reserve Bank wants to see inflation at over the, over the course of a business cycle. Now, Philip Lowe, the governor has been at pains to point out while everyone's sort of beating him over the head saying you're behind the curve as well and you need to start raising interest rates. It's been about seven years since they've managed to get it up into the bottom end of their target band. Um, so again, he's very much aware of what's going on in the marketplace. What, what are the contributing forces to Australian inflation? Um, and, a, and a bit of a busy chart, but it's kind of the same story as the one we've spent a bit of detail going through in America. Um, on the right-hand side there, you can see inflation's gone from 1% uh, um, in the first quarter of 2021 through to about 3.5%. So if I just flick back again, that's the blue line, the blue dotted line there. That's the normal headline CPI number, which is currently about three and a half. That's what you're seeing here in the black line as well. And just some commentary here from the economists at, um, at one of the investment banks, again, making the point that was, you know, the, the red and the sort of beigey colored numbers there, what's driving our inflation outcome. And let's, let's also point out it's three and a half, not eight. Um, there's a fundamental difference there, obviously, between ourselves and the Americans, but it's being driven by short term impacts. It's being driven by the cost of uh, oil, energy uh, in the transport sector, and also from our local perspective, some housing, um, housing price rises are in there as well, and some, some increased costs and the reduction of subsidies and those sorts of things. Sebastian's got a copy of the slides, which I know he'll be happy to share with you as well, so you can have these as a, as a reference um, when, when we finish up here. Um, Before you move on, just just obviously, you know, the government came out last night with a budget that was all about, you know, trying to, I guess, help help the public with cost of living. And the big talk from the political um, commentators after the announcement was, you know, what kind of impact it's going to have on inflation and and, and the concerns are that it may. In saying, but then showing what you just, you know, in, in, in discussing what you just, do you think these short term measures will really have any? Oh, look, they're certainly going to help those households and, and lower income households, you know, need some help now. Let's yeah. let's not kid ourselves that we're not within weeks of a federal election. Um, yeah. And, you know, if, if the election was two years away, they may have still enacted the same policies. We'll never know. Yeah. Those counterfactuals yeah. are always difficult to analyse. Um, you know, I think that, that they've... I've got quite a bit of respect for Frydenberg. I think he's done a reasonable job um, in managing the economy. Um, the boom in the resources sector has given him some cover to make yeah. these sorts of payments. Importantly, ratings agency Standard & Poor's came out and said, look, they see no concerns in terms of our fiscal outlook. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they've certainly made, made clear that they intend to tighten their belt down the track as well when the economy is on a sounder footing for sure, yeah. Fair enough. Thanks, John. Um, 
the, the key piece to the, the, I think, you know, which is yet to play out in some senses is the labour market. And, and the strength of our labour market is a really encouraging sign. If you've read any of my commentaries, and I know you all have, uh, you'll, you'll know I've been focusing a lot on not just the, the sort of headline unemployment rates, but this measure of aggregate hours worked in the economy. So, you know, it avoids the sort of things where, you know, I'm still technically employed, but I've got zero hours for the month, you know, because my, the cafe I work in is shut down. This really does matter measure, you know, the, with, with a much higher frequency and accuracy, we think the, the, the health of the underlying labour market, and it's close to record highs, you know, that's the, that's the short story. Um, we've, we've seen some volatility there, um, that, that sort of spike right in the start of 2022 is apparently just people taking holidays um, with the ability to, you know, with borders open again and, and, and people taking annual leave. So it's, it's a really quite sensitive and high frequency indicator there, and it's giving us a healthy indicator of, of the state of the, the labour market in Australia. Um, I did, this is, this is not something you'll see very often, but I think it's a really fascinating chart. So this is the, what we call the labour force participation rate. So of, the, of all the people that could work, how many are? And again, I want to point out the difference here between America in the red and Australia. And it's, it's acknowledged globally as a policy success, the JobKeeper payments, keeping, keeping people attached to their employers, allowing them to come back to work quickly, um, is why we don't currently have some of the wages pressures that we're seeing in other countries like America. Um, we've got a much bigger supply of labour there's an ongoing debate around this sort of great resignation, great retirement in America, which I think is a bit spurious, but probably not got time to go through in great detail at the moment. But our labour market's in a much stronger state. We've got a much bigger supply of labour, which means we, we're not going to have the wages spiralling out of control and therefore requiring central banks to, to hike up interest rates to keep them under control. So Philip Lowe, if you, if you read any of his speeches, and I would encourage you to do so, they're quite approachable and, and, and do give you a very good understanding of what the bank's thinking. He's very happy to be patient. He's very happy to be at the back of the queue in terms of raising interest rates and see how other markets uh, develop over the course of the year. Not least our cousins across the ditch in New Zealand who uh, are on a much more aggressive path. So they're gonna be fascinating to watch, but that's a story for another time. Here's the wages story. So in the top, it's headline wages. In the middle panel, it's inflation. If we take inflation away from wages, it's real wages growth. How much are wages growing relative to price pressures? And right now they're not, it's minus 0.3 because you've seen that inflation spike from one up to 2.6. Um, we expect that to moderate over time. We expect um, the labour market to further tighten. Again, Philip Lowe and the, and the RBA are very focused on, on really what they're talking about as a sort of generational opportunity to achieve full, full employment in Australia. And so they're, they're not going to jeopardise our recovery just to, you know, to jack up interest rates and try and keep a lid on inflation when it's only within the middle of their target band anyway. All right, so this is just a last view here on one of the key aspects of the, the, again, central banks pay attention to is this notion of whether inflation expectations are anchored. So if people start to think, you know, prices are going to get out of control, it starts to infect um, thinking around business investment and employment and decision making and those sorts of things. We, we've certainly seen some significant shift on the far right hand side of this chart here. The white line there is Australia. You know, in the depths of the coronavirus, the long-term inflation expectations were not much above zero. Now they're at two and a half, kind of back to where we were not that many years ago. And again, within, within the middle, midpoint of the RBA's target band there, got between two and 3%. If these start to shoot up, then you start to get worried that central banks are gonna to have to be more drastic in what they do in terms of raising interest rates, but that doesn't look to be the case for now. Excuse me, just a second. <laughs> with um the uh, story i probably should raise is the, on the slide you're talking about wages but mm. is it really the the, the the question around underemployment is that really the the, the problem that we're uh, facing here in Australia? Far less, far less so than it was we've actually really seen some quite substantial improvements in underemployment as well um, yeah yeah, that's, that's mm, don't hold me to it, but that's at about a seven or eight year low, something like that. Yeah. And really it's because of this one here, you know, yeah. the, actual, the actual work being done in the economy is close to record highs. 
Yeah, true, true. So, so that's, you know, it's um, it's it's an encouraging sign. You know, we, we will start to see some, some you know, tension between supply and demand in the labour market, which will lead to good wages outcomes um, over the short to medium term. I think that's, you know, the focus has been around that sort of 18 month, 24 month, you know, period where we will start to see this number, that sort of 2.3 nominal wage growth head up to that, you know, where we saw back through periods of, of, of strong economic growth through that, you know, the early part of the 2000s. If we could see that number back at sort of three, three and a half and inflation under control, that'd be a really good outcome for the economy and for households generally. Fantastic. Just got another question from Kanyo. Are you there, Kanyo? Can you? Yeah, John. Uh, my question, uh, being, a, being a business advisor, mostly obviously looking after businesses and mostly in the SME area. And I guess uh, one of the things that uh, my clients have, have looked at uh, with the budget last night is it wasn't too much in there realistically for business and our yeah, job keeper and the stimulus that c- came in, a lot of it was, it was for employee base. Uh, and, you know, you can argue both sides. There, there, there was, all right, looking just, at Struggle just, Street, I'm looking at the wages. Of it. You there, mate? Breaking up a little bit, Kanye. Yeah, that's okay. Keep continue. Break up a bit. Okay, today. Yeah, so I'm looking at I'm after businesses, and I'm looking at the, the business on Struggle Street, and I'm thinking that uh, wages wages indications from the budget last night aren't entirely, you know, representative to to the people I'm speaking on the street. I'm speaking to people who have in their lifetime never seen a labour market so tight and and, and hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. finding people uh, to work for them never been never been uh, uh, harder um, wages growth you would think that eventually what's going to happen as as uh, I know it only says wages growth is maybe looking at getting to three to four percent I'm looking at businesses that are in in boom areas and we're looking at wages growth going crazy sometimes with double figures yeah. being able to because people employees are becoming mercenaries almost and, and basically saying well if you want me this is what I this is what I want so yep. I'm thinking a lot of those figures are coming from potentially, uh, you know, skewed with with government sector and potentially other sectors that are uh, people going into part time or or work from home or whatever. But what I'm seeing is that the labour market is totally difficult at the moment, uh, and it is jeopardising a lot of big businesses and small businesses um, surviving, let alone actually making money. Yeah, I, do you work with businesses in particular sectors generally, or across broad swaths of parts of the economy? No, I'm, I'm, I'm across, across uh, all different uh, okay. sectors. So um, yeah, obviously, I mean, don't don't do much in the, in the government sectors or sure. or um, big mining or anything like that. Yep, yep. Look, yeah, uh, there's there's always going to be rich levels of detail that make up the aggregates that we talk about here. Um, and certainly, as you mentioned there, the government sector is one area where there's reasonable restraint in terms of wages, and that will impact the overall labour market for Australia. So things like enterprise bargaining agreements that have locked in relatively modest wage growth for the next couple of years, representing, again, don't hold me to the number, I don't know, 20, 30% of the labour market, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm not denying your experiences whatsoever. Um, and certainly I've heard, you know, similar sorts of stories around people that, uh, or, you know, potential employees that have unrealistic um, expectations, perhaps from, from, you know, the side of the desk that we sit on. Um, I, so, yeah, necessarily when we, when we look at these in aggregate, we don't get that level of detail, but... You know, the, certainly the bank, from an RBA point of view, has an extensive business liaison program. So they're they're very much aware of of those you know on the ground at the coalface um, experiences about which you speak as well. Um, so that does feed into their thinking. And you know, fortunate through some of the access we have to to regularly hear speakers that um, from from the RBA in particular, um, and and they often recount those stories about their business liaison. So. Um, my experience yeah. is pretty exactly it'd, it'd be described there as well, but we're talking necessarily in sort of, you know, beige uh, economic aggregates here rather than, you know, at, at, at individual detail level. Yeah, and I guess it'd be interesting to see what data, you know, um, uh, small business groups uh, might be accumulating on their own statistics because uh, at the end of the day, like we always used to talk about, you know, the quiet Australia that got uh, Scott Morrison elected, uh, and also we talk about the two-speed economy when we had the mining boom. Yeah. I think this happening at the moment where there's, there's data that's coming from the budget isn't necessarily re- representative of the SME market. 
And we all know that uh, the SME market uh, is really where the coalition sort of gets a lot of votes from. And I'm just concerned from my constituents that I speak to a lot, uh, saying all the time that they're having the same issues where uh, there's just no no labour out there. And if there is labour, they, they've, they've been put uh, almost uh, on the on on, on the margins trying to, to, to secure labour any costs, uh, which again, uh, in this industry, in this, in this time, because of inflation reactions, we're not able to pass on to, 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 um, to clients or to customers. And therefore, it is really struggling uh, businesses moving forward. And so that, that's just a comment that uh, I know that the audience potentially in this uh, group may be individuals, uh, self-funded retirees, but I do know they'll be on the pool various business owners uh and i'm sure that uh of those ones that i represent anyway uh pretty con- pretty much concur with what i'm saying so i just wanted to make sure that i get it some- i do I, I do hear you and i do understand and accept what you're saying absolutely yep sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there no, mate, that's good. No, I appreciate it. It's, Thank it's, you. It, to be honest, it's also an area where I think we're in a much better shape than the Americans are as well. You know, we go back to that labour force participation thing. Um, and it's it's probably a topic for another time uh, again. But, there's, you know, if we take a really big picture, multi-decade view of things here as well, and we think about the, the, the sort of divide of economic growth, the how do we share up the spoils of output between capital and labour, um, certainly more in, more so in America, capital's held the upper hand and written the rules for decades and decades and decades. And this is seen as an opportunity over there in particular, and, and, and perhaps there's an element of that creeping into the Australian landscape as well, uh, for Labor to actually, you know, um, assert themselves while they've got a little bit of, a little bit of power in the, in, in the balance here. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, it's going to be a fascinating one to, to keep an eye on. I guess the other thing for Australia, and, and it's going to be very dependent on which sectors we're talking about as well, is as we start to open the borders, we'll see international migration pick up again and then some further supply of labour come, which hopefully alleviates some of those pressures you've been talking about and seeing with the clients that you deal with. All right, so... Um, this is just government bond yields. This is how much do governments pay to borrow uh, on 10-year bonds. Um, the white line again is Australia. You can see uh, just a tick above 1% back in sort of August of last year and nearly 3% now. Um, some really substantial increases. Uh, I mentioned before the New Zealand's, one of my investment committee colleagues keeps referring to them as lab rats. Um, the central bank over there is is really on a mission to try and raise interest rates quickly. And it's going to be fascinating to watch what impacts that has on things like the labour market and the housing market over there. Famously, New Zealand often describe their economy as being a housing market with an economy attached. So even more sensitivities there than, uh, than maybe we're used to here in Australia as well. Um, Japan is the red line across the bottom there. We've seen interest rates there at sort of zero or thereabouts for decades. Even there, you're starting to see the, you know some signs of life. Um, Germany with significantly negative interest rates for a long period of time as the ECB, uh, sorry, the European Central Bank um, sought to stimulate their economy. We've seen some, some quite significant shifts there as well. So this has really important ramifications for important parts in, of the defensive assets within your portfolio. And, and simply what we see is the price of a portfolio of bonds or, or, or bonds individually moves in the opposite direction to the way bond yields go. Um, so if you think about it, you know, even something like a term deposit as well, if, if two years ago they were paying 2%, but today a new issue is paying 4%, then if you want to sell the thing that's still got some years to run on it, that's only paying 2%, you better give me a discount. Otherwise, I just go and buy the new thing that's paying 4%. So as we see interest rates increase, prices come off. And that's the inverse relationship that you're seeing in the two panels here. AGVT is the, is the exchange traded fund we use to hold government bonds in your portfolio. And then that it's that same 10 year bond yield um, in, in the bottom panel there. Um, so what we've found here is we've, we've done a little bit of buying. Uh, as after we saw that initial collapse, that first run up in interest rates in, in March of last year, um, we, we actually contemplated doing some selling as we sort of got to that peak around August, September and, and didn't quite get to the prices and valuations that we were looking for. And then as prices have fallen again, um, we've, we've done some additional buy to top that up. 
More recently, the buying we've done has not been in the government bond piece, but in um, investment grade corporate bonds, where on top of the interest rate and then sort of the you know the compensation you're getting for for term duration for for how long the money's invested for. Uh, you get extra compensation for the credit risk on, on lending to companies rather than governments. And that's also been um, at an historically low level for up until the, la the very, uh, very recent uh, while, but we've started to see better compensation there as well. In the weekly that went out on Friday, we spoke about their sort of shifting some money into cred, um, which, which holds these investment grade corporate bonds at, at sort of 4.4%. So reasonable compensation there for taking on risk, we think. The important point I wanna make is, you know, if you look at your portfolios now and you look at that government bond thing, there'll be some red numbers on there in the short term. And, and that might continue for a little while to come. This is a really old chart that I've sort of dusted off because we haven't been in a rising interest rate environment for a very long time. What it does is make the very simple point that there's a very, very high correlation between your eventual long-term return from your portfolio of bonds with your starting yield. In fact, we can think about that in terms of the elements of the forecasting we spoke about up front. How much income do you get? The starting yield. Uh, how much, how quickly will that income grow in a bond? Not at all. And what's the valuation piece on a bond? Well, assuming it doesn't default and we've got AAA rated government debt, then there's no valuation piece there if we hold it for long enough as well. So we might see some volatility around the bond markets. You know, there's certainly a view that uh, we, we, you know, that, that they'll, they'll push higher before settling back. Um, you know, typically we see central banks that manipulate interest rates at the shorter end of, of durations here and, and typically the cash rate, obviously in Australia. Um, you know, there's there's some expectations out there that we might see as many as six or seven or eight interest rate increases from the RBA by the end of the year, which just seems wildly over the top um, to myself and to my colleagues on the investment committee. So it might be a little bit of a bumpy ride. We're going to average in at around this sort of two, two and a half percent level um, at the moment. And if we if we do see further opportunities, we might get better than that again. Um, and this is just the same chart with a more updated version showing that that relationship continues to track there as well. So when it's all said and done and we've established our position in government bonds at say an average entry yield of call it two and a half, maybe a little bit higher, that's gonna be the long-term term, long -term return you get from that investment in the defensive part of your portfolio. Uh, and for us, that's a reasonable compensation for taking on not much risk as I mentioned, in debt issued by, uh, by a AAA rated government sovereign supported by a reasonably robust Australian economy. I'm conscious of time, so let me push forward a little bit here as well. These tipping points charts will hopefully be familiar to you. As I mentioned, they go on the back of, uh, of the longer form commentaries. A couple of key elements here. The red dotted line at the top there is currently at two and a half percent. And I'm just gonna skip that quickly. This corresponds with the red line on this page here. So 10 year government bonds again in Australia, the red line's just an average of what they've done over the last 20 days, just to smooth some of those bumps out. Uh, you know, we may well see that sort of 2.8 number settle back towards 2.5, if not we'll adjust, adjust the numbers as the averages move. Now, each of these columns here represents a risky asset class, Australian equities, developed overseas markets, emerging overseas markets, and then property on the, on the, on the right-hand side. And so what our process says, if we expect to get less out of a risky asset than you can get out of a risk-free asset, currently paying two and a half percent, and the risky asset's expensive. Right now, America for us is expensive. I've got you know, a long-term forecast return on US equities of around zero. Um, and and, and it's, it's, been, it's been negative, it's been slightly positive. It's been that way a long time. We've been out of the US equity market for a long time. I'm happy to, happy to talk about that if anyone does want to answer further questions there, ask further questions. Um, and then if I can just focus on the bottom left-hand corner again quickly, it's those same three elements of, of our long-term forecasting. How much income, how quickly are earnings going to grow, and what's the valuation piece likely to do? So right now, the earnings recovery in Australia has actually been quite strong. Uh, and we, we expect that to moderate over time. And these sort of tend to offset each other. Right now, because we've had 
um, that strong earnings recovery, the ratio of our price to earnings, that, that which is the valuation piece here, looks pretty reasonable because we've got we're not we're not paying much relative for quite strong earnings. Um, so mid sixes gets us into the bottom end of fair value for Australian equities, and that's consistent with the move we made over the most of last year, where we moved from quite a decent overweight in uh, in Aussie equities back to a neutral. For now, we're pretty happy to sit at neutral. If we were to see the market push on substantially further from here and we get up into that upper end of fair value, you should expect us to start moving into underweight territory relative to neutral in your portfolio. And we always do that in conjunction with Sebastian. He has ongoing conversations with our portfolio management team as well. And any of those high level decisions that we make as an investment committee can be tailored individually for your own circumstances there. Um, moving across the columns, uh, decent exposure to the UK. It's actually performed pretty well post the Brexit overhang. Um, obviously sits on the periphery of Europe and hasn't been as directly impacted as, as mainland Europe has because of the, the war in Ukraine. Um, but the underlying fundamentals in Europe were actually pretty sound before we had this sentiment hit. And we, we sort of, you know, this big unknown, this big uncertainty, what's, what impact is it going to have in terms of, you know, how European companies pay their dividends, grow their earnings uh, is a bit, little bit up in the air. Um, Japan looks cheap for us at the moment as well. Not least we've seen a big currency impact, which I'll talk to you about in just a second. Um, Asia PAC, we, we reduced substantially, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, we've still got some reasonable, reasonably diversified exposure there. And really what's been driving the PAC uh, has been a decent exposure to Taiwan, which is dominated by the Taiwan Semiconductor Company. Uh, which has benefited from the chip shortage and, and increased prices for semiconductor chips there as well. And on the far side is, pro is property trusts. Um, the, the, the acronym there is Australian Real Estate Investment Trusts, AREITs. Um, still a little bit of uncertainty around, around the office sector, but some encouraging signs and some big deals being done in Sydney and Melbourne CBD office markets. Um, the industrial sector there has continued to do very well um, through the pandemic and beyond. And, and um, you know, some recovery in retail, we saw a pretty strong retail, sp uh, retail spending number out today at 1.8% growth. Um, so reasonable signs of recovery there as well. We've got a modest overweight um, on, on the property sector there and happy to sit on that one for the time being. So then very quickly, I just wanted to point out currencies here. So this is the performance of the Australian dollar relative to the yen in the top, uh, the euro in the blue line, sterling in the yellow. And they're the three that are important to us in the international equities asset class. When those lines go up, that's a headwind to performance. Um, and that's been a pretty strong headwind, which is unusual in the current cycle. Um, and, and mainly because of the supply disruptions in key commodities that we've seen some significant strength and, and increased demand for Australian iron ore, coal, oil. Um, and so that's certainly hurting performance. You know, they're, they're sort of 10% moves um, across those three currencies at the top. The red, um, not, not quite so much against the US dollar, which I just include as a reference there and probably one that we're more familiar with. But if we pull it out over the longer term, you kind of get a bit of a wash on here. So our policy has always been to remain unhedged for currency. In a more typical investment cycle, when, when things start to turn down, the Aussie dollar turns down as well, and that gives a boost to the, um, to the unhedged international equities returns. Um, and then when things go well, we sort of, you know, we give up a little bit of return in strong times because the A dollar tends to appreciate as well. So yeah, quite an unusual cycle here just in the last couple of months because of this war in Ukraine, but equally one I think which could unwind fairly quickly as well if we start to see resolutions in some of those conflicts and, and some return to normality over there as well. To give you a real, real sense of that, this is the, um, the fund that we use to invest in Japan over a five year time frame. So the red line there is, is Japanese, the performance of the underlying Japanese companies that you own um, in Australian dollar terms. And for you know, several years there, you know, substantial outperformance through 2029 and 2020. Um, and then just recently on the far right hand side there, you can see quite a significant gap. And that's one I'd expect to normalize um, as, as we see that, that currency rate come back from you know, that sort of 10, 11% uh, percent appreciation we've seen. And then quickly, just on Australia, um, I won't dwell on this too much. Um, you know, the green line there is resources, huge swings in the resources sector or a high beta, high beta sector, as we talk about in the jargon. Um, the yellow there is the financial sector. Um, key, key position for us, still an overweight within the asset class, still reasonable value there as well. 
Um, really pleasing to see the most recent company reporting season sort of fulfill some of the expectations we had in our forecast for the restoration of dividends, which were put on hold by APRA, um, demanding that banks, you know, hang on to their capital while we had so much uncertainty through um, through the pandemic. Um, so still some good value there out of the out of the financials, and we're happy to maintain an overweight within the otherwise neutral asset class there as well. Sorry, just, just a quick one on, on that and in terms mm. of exposures. Obviously, um, the portfolio's moved out of small caps Yes. a little while ago. Um, any any further thoughts on that? Are we staying out of that, that mark, those markets for a while? Yeah, yet? that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, so March, let's call it March last year, a number three of our number five of, of our five investment programs had about 28% exposure to Australian equities across a combination of the top 50 companies, the financial sector, the medium-sized 50 companies, and then smaller companies as well. And they performed pretty well. Um, the pink line there is the mid cap. So you can see that doing very well and leading the market there through all of 2021. Um, so that and the red, um, which you can see was sort of leading the pack, there were other than the second in order there through the back half of last year. Because of that increased, um, because of that strong performance, we had diminished return expectations. So, you know, our, our long-term forecasts for mids and smalls were down to sort of threes and fours versus sevens and eights on the larger companies, the resources, financials, and, and, and just the top 50. So that was a fairly easy decision. And we basically enacted the full reduction from 28 um, in, in Aussie equities through number three, all the way back to 20, which we did from April through to about October out of those mids and smalls. And they've since underperformed somewhat um, since then. So that's been a pleasing decision, the way we've implemented that one. There's a small residual there in mid caps, um, just because we got to target, we didn't need to sell anymore. But uh, yeah, thank you. That's 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 a really good point to um, to to make. Hopefully, um, and then just one slide to finish on because I want to just finish on an optimistic note. This is the Aussie market total return, um, price growth plus income, which just yesterday or today as well set an all time high. Um, and sort of talking with some colleagues and and you know people were surprised. There's this mood out in the market. Obviously, we're still dealing with COVID and, and dealing with it close to home in, in a lot of cases. Um, and obviously, you know, lots of headlines dealing with um, conflict overseas and all sorts of other issues. But um, the, the, the Aussie market's just hit an all time high if we include dividends in the process as well. So I just wanted to leave that one up uh, as, a, as a finishing point. And um, yeah, be happy to happy to answer any further questions. But thank you for um, thank you for spending some time tonight and, um, and for the questions along the way through. Well, thank you, John. Thank, uh, you know, as usual, it's uh, always a great presentation. You, you know, you take your time to really explain, you know, the 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 theory and the and the methodology behind some of the decisions you guys are making on the coal face there as, as part of the investment committee. Um, yeah, did anyone have any final questions? I appreciate um, the questions that did come through tonight. Um, but we would have a couple of minutes just to check off anything, or if you've got any any just you know stirring ideas that you wish maybe John to help you. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, cement, I guess. But um, but if we don't have any questions, that's fine as well. No problem. Um, yeah, uh, obviously, John, maybe tell us a little bit of background about implemented portfolios while well, you've got maybe a minute. Just so any new new guests here tonight maybe don't know too much about implemented journey, implemented you know, sure. or journey so far. We uh, we started in the middle of 2010 and we grew out of an advice business like Sebastian's um, because we got frustrated with the way most of the mainstream funds management industry operated and we wanted to, um, you know, build a portfolio service where we worked collaboratively with the end investor and their advisors and that's really been the, the ethos and philosophy that's driven our approach. Um, you know, personally consider myself fortunate to work with some really well credentialed um, and experienced colleagues on our investment committee. There's four of us that have been at this um, since before we started implemented. So, you know, the same people making decisions using the same processes for over 12 years or bang on 12 years, a little bit more than that. Now. Um, and, you know, really, I guess, really appreciative that it's been um, a slow journey to, to build and hopefully retain and, 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 you know, the trust and relationships that are at the heart of this business. Um, you know, one of the challenges we face is sort of, 
uh, convincing people that taking a, a, a transparent, you know, seemingly relatively simple approach in terms of, you know, how we make decisions and how we build portfolios, you know, we'll, we'll get the job done. We'll get you to achieving your retirement and lifestyle objectives that you sit down and manage with Sebastian. And we're, um, we're hopefully playing a role in the background here as, as Sebastian manages your individual circumstances and preferences. And, and really that's what, you know, that's the heart of the business is the trust that you guys have in Sebastian. And, by, by virtue of his relationship with us, we're you know privileged and, and, and pleased to um, to work with you on an ongoing basis. Um, sadly, uh, due to some very close contact, personal contact with the virus, I wasn't able mm. to be there in person this time. But uh, I'd love to come and meet you all face to face uh, later in the year. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. All right, I um, I think we can probably wrap it up. Um... I appreciate everyone's uh, attention tonight and obviously joining us and John, obviously for your time and hopefully you do feel a bit better soon and I'm hopefully we do see you maybe up in Brisbane, maybe uh, at the end, uh, end of the year, um, around August, September, I think you noted to me. So yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, without further ado, yeah, we'll probably just wrap it up there tonight and thank you again. Thanks, everyone.